week and, and told everybody, you know, that we took you to a Pink Floyd yeah. tribute concert. You may want to re-poll everybody and make sure. Hey, well, good morning and welcome, everyone. It's great to see you all this morning. Just uh, what, a, what a glorious day to be in God's house, huh? If you would, uh, for those who are out in the foyer, if you haven't gotten a, a seat yet, if you'd come in and uh, find a spot. And for everybody who's in here, if you'd stand and join us, we're going we're gonna to sing some songs of praise and worship this morning. And it's, just a, it's all about just, just worshiping a holy God on a beautiful day. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the dark and shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring.
you may be seated. Well, thank you, Rod. Does this belong to anybody? No, we found it. Oh, we found it. Okay. All right. Well, we're glad you're here. Um, we got a great God, and uh, as we said a couple weeks ago, I read a great quote out of the, one of the commentaries. It says, um, we worship together not to make us feel good, but we get together to say that we have a wonderful God. And uh, so scripture tells us that uh, God desires a people who, who, who will declare the praises of him who called them out of darkness into the kingdom of light. And so that's what we want to do. We want to say we have a great God and uh, we appreciate everything that he's done for us. So at this time, I, I wanted to do some business. Um, Rod and Michelle, Bob, I'm finally getting around to welcoming them to the church. I, uh, they, they wanted me to get you in before you changed your mind. <laughs> so, so if you'll come up and this is uh, Rod and uh, Michelle Smith. Now, I, I think you visited July 4th. Is that possible? Was it one year ago, two years ago? Uh, they, uh, they visited church, and I grabbed Tito and Mierna, and I said, uh, I invited them out for lunch because Bellachino's was closed, right. and we were going to go there. And I said to myself, I don't know if I told Tito and Marina, I said, they're quiet. I'm afraid we're going to have to carry the conversation. <laughs> so, so just be prepared. And it was just the total opposite. Because <laughs> they were military people. And how, what, how did you say the military works? If, if, if you didn't initiate the conversation, you never had friends. So can I have one of those microphones? And yeah, I want them to hear. So, so it, we had a, a delightful um, lunch and they disappeared a little while, while because they lived in um, New Jersey as well. And then they came back and found out Rod was a guitar player and we had been praying for a worship leader. So. It was an answer to prayer that they would come back, especially after having lunch with me and Tito and me. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, no. So, uh, Ken, you just want to introduce yourself. Rod, Rod and Michelle Smith, and um, you're retired from the military. Just give us a little uh, history. Well, okay. uh, the short, short version. Uh, and make sure they can hear you. Okay. We, uh, we were. Uh, um, an army family. We did. Uh, Michelle was in the service. That's where we met. Um, and uh, we got married and she got out of the army and followed me around for the next I don't know, 12, 13 years. And then uh, we retired uh, almost 20 years ago now and uh, living in New Jersey and, uh, and bought a place here in 2020. And we uh, liked it so much, we decided we'd stay. So that's why we're here. Yeah. And you have two, two boys, two boys, uh, both grown and we've moved them down here as well. So we have our family together. So it's real nice. And uh, you retired as uh, what you do in the military? Uh, I was a, I was a helicopter pilot for most of my career. Um, and he was in tanks before the tanks, the infantry, all of, you know, all of that type of stuff. So. And Michelle was, uh, MP, military police. I tell you, you wouldn't want to tangle with her. You know? <laughs> That's the truth. They say that they say that the only the, the only type of person that can tame an army aviator is a military police officer. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, they were uh, you met in Washington D.C. Is that correct? Yep. And what was your job in Washington D.C., Michelle? Well, I started out as an MP and then I moved to, a, I was still an MP officer, but I moved to a protocol job. Okay, which means? 
I told generals where to stand and when to salute. Oh, okay, okay, all right. You notice she didn't say I told generals where to go. Okay? Uh, just where to sit. And, uh, and so they, uh, your father's buried in Arlington yeah. over the last year. And uh, so, and you were a Lieutenant Colonel and uh, she was a captain. And w w what was the story? She wouldn't salute to you? Well, I'll let you tell that. <laughs> you tell it better than I do. She said, aren't you going to salute me? And I said, well, if you get to kiss me, I don't have to salute you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, well, as I say, uh, it's a pleasure having Rod and Michelle be a part of the group. Uh, uh, they care about people. They love the Lord. And they've been a, a delight with the worship team. And uh, even when Sue was in the hospital um, with her brief stroke, they were wonderful to care for you. Yeah, so, so it's a pleasure having you. Um, like I said, we pray that God will send us new people that will have a desire to please him and be a part of their family. So thank you. So, well, let me um, pray, with, pray for you, I guess, and then um, we'll move on. Uh, Father, we thank you for Rod and Michelle. Uh, thank you that you worked in their heart and brought them to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, we thank you um, for their boys, Dennis and Matthew. And we ask that uh, you would help Dennis to be able to pass his engineering test. And, and, and Matthew would uh, enjoy living here in Florida. And uh, just pray for the family that they would be united in their love for one another, their love for Jesus Christ, uh, that you would uh, give them all wisdom, protect them from the evil one, and bring honor and glory to you. And we, we ask that we as a church would love them unconditionally, that we would pray for them, encourage them, and uh, comfort them, rejoice with them when they rejoice, and weep with them when they weep, and uh, give them great joy and being a part of the family here, um, giving them great joy in using their spiritual gifts to help us become closer to Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. That's awesome. Is that yours? Okay. Um, then you can, I'm just going to let you look at the, we've got a congregational meeting Sunday, January 29th. And if you have, uh, you can read that. And I'm, I'm just going to let you, Sue, you want to say anything about your Bible study? Well, she really knows how to grow a group. I, I always knew if you, if you had pretty girls in the high school youth group, it would grow, <laughs> right? But uh, it's a women's Bible study, right? Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Sue. We appreciate you and Dan as well. So um, let me pray, and then we will um, have a call to worship. And... Uh, Praise the Lord together. Father, what a wonderful privilege it is to be your child. We acknowledge that we're totally undeserving. And uh, we consider it a privilege to praise your name. We thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. And that you'll be with us always until the end of the age. Help us not to be afraid because you're faithful and good and kind. And as we worship you this morning, help us to encourage one another as we speak of your greatness 
your love and your faithfulness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'll stand together, we have a call to worship. Uh, actually, I, I kind of took this call to worship because I was listening to the news, you know, and I uh, heard about, read about that six-year-old shooting his first grade teacher in Newport News, Virginia. And I said, this is terrible. And so what I did, I took the first couple of slides here, and it's a responsive reading. We'll flip each side, and then we'll say the last slide together is, you know, we need to get back to the basics. Like, that little boy needs to know God and his family. So, so this is a responsive reading. It's children's catechism, but it, uh, who made you? God. God. Here, there we go. I've got it. What else did God make? All things. All things. Now, why did God make you in all things? For his, his own, own glory. glory. And how can we glorify God? By loving, By loving him, him and obeying, and obeying his, his commandments. commandments. Let us Let sing, sing for joy, joy to the Lord. Lord. Let, Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Okay, we've been through that one more time. I, I'm going to, Stephen, you're going to change. the. Can we go back to the beginning? You know what it is now, right? I know what it is now. All right. So you're changing it, Steve. Who made you? God. Now, what else did God make? All things. Now, why did God make you in all things? For his, his own glory. glory. Now, how can we glorify God? By loving him and obeying his commandments. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and songs. Amen. So, so let us extol him with music and songs. So if you would uh, just remain standing, we're going to do a few more songs here. The first one, the chorus goes like this. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. So we're going to sing glorious day. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin
indeed he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified me. Great. Oh, Mr. 
I sound fantastic today. <laughs> okay, the, the last song we're going to do um, is, uh, it's, a, it's a great one. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a, I guess, revelation and time sort of thing, but, but it really it's, it's a, you know, it's just praise of, uh, uh, you know, our Lord and Savior and this praise that we're going to be, that we're going to be singing forever you know, in heaven, because um, when you think about it, just, that's what we're going to do there, you know, we're going to, we're just going to be in praise all the time, and uh, boy, what a great eternity that's going to be, I think, so anyway, this is uh, called Revelation Song. Thank you. 
Miss Susie. All right, children can be dismissed. Go with Miss Susie. Thank you, Susie. Well, the way we pray, we want to give you an opportunity um, to talk to the Lord yourself silently. And so we work through a time of confession, time of adoration, time of uh, thanksgiving and supplication and uh, I'll pray a short prayer after each of those segments so let's spend just a few moments um, confessing our sin to the father Father, um, forgive us, uh, be merciful to us. Uh, we admit that we're sinners by nature and by choice. Uh, sinners um, from our time of birth. And we, we ask that you would uh, create within us a clean heart and steadfast spirit that we might serve you. And uh, that you would um, forgive us all the sins that we've committed this week that uh, the sins that we knowingly did as well as the sins that we did in ignorance for we acknowledge that we have fallen short of your glory your perfection your holiness this week and so we ask you to forgive us for Christ's sake And now let's spend a few moments just praising God for his greatness and his glory and his majesty. Just uh, praise him for who he is. Father, we praise you because you're the only living and true God. There are no gods but you. And we praise you because you're holy. You're perfect. You're unchanging. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, you're from everlasting to everlasting. You don't grow weary or tired. And um, you're faithful to all of your promises. You're gracious and merciful, kind, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. You're the almighty, king of kings and the Lord of lords. We praise you, Father. And now let's spend some moments just uh, giving thanks to God for the things that he has given us. Father, we thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the hope that we have beyond the grave. Uh, 
God. We thank you for the hope that we have to be, that to depart and be with Christ is better by far. And we thank you for your promises. And we thank you for your commands because they're for our own good. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that indwells us until the day of redemption. We thank you, Father, for our families. We thank you for our friends. We thank you for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for our freedom. We thank you for our homes and our possessions. We, we thank you for the beautiful weather. What a wonderful privilege we have to be your children. And uh, we thank you because every good and perfect gift that we have comes from your hand. And we acknowledge that it can be taken away from us at any time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now let's uh, spend some moment just in asking God for anything that your heart desires. I'd encourage you to pray for the salvation of uh, people in your family that don't know Christ as their Savior. Father, we ask that more and more people might acknowledge that you're the only living true God, the creator of all things, the judge of all mankind. We pray that more and more people might honor you, love you, and serve you, and please you with their lives. And we ask that our, your will would be done in our lives. Help us to love you with all our heart and soul and strength mind. Help us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Uh, we pray that you would help us to love our families. Help us to love our spouses. Help us to honor our fathers and mothers. Help us to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And uh, we ask that you would work in the hearts of our family members that don't know Christ as their Savior, that you would show them their need for a Savior and that you would give them genuine saving faith in Christ. Uh, we, we ask that you would work in our lives to willing to do your good pleasure. And we ask that we as a church might uh, be able, be faithful to teach your word clearly, accurately, boldly. And that we, we as a family of believers here would bring honor and glory to your name. Help us to be united in our desire to glorify you and, and live lives worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus. Fill us and control us with your Holy Spirit. And uh, help us to love one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, comfort one another. Help us to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And uh, I pray that you might be with uh, Dick Casto, that you would uh, help him recover fully from his COVID, that he would be able to walk without difficulty, and that uh, he would be able to think clearly and not be confused. And I pray for um, Connie that you would encourage her and surround her with people who love her and care for her at this time, and, and that um, we give them sweet times together as a couple. And I ask that you would um, be with Susie, give her a great time with her daughter, Louise, as she comes to visit this week and um, just help them to encourage each other spiritually and, and emotionally. I pray for John Augustine. I thank you that he didn't have to have his gallbladder removed this week. And I pray that um, you bring him back to full health, that he would uh, be able to be active in our congregation again. And um, just show yourself strong on his behalf and answer his prayers. And uh, I pray for Jacob Cannell that he'd be able to breathe without oxygen. I pray for Bill Chrysler that his lungs would breathe, would um, 
he'd be able to breathe and his lungs would function as well as Jacob's, the way that you created them to function, and that he too would be able to uh, live at home without a need for oxygen. And I pray for Jim Wilson that you'd give him um, good health, that you'd keep him cancer free all the days of his life, that you'd give him a sharp mind and help his heart to beat steadily and strongly. Help him to bring honor and glory to you with his life. And I pray that you would surround he and Sharon with people who love them and care for them. I thank you for the Snowbirds. Thank you for Bill and Miriam and, and uh, the others that meet in the Agape Sunday School class. I just pray that uh, they'd have a great winter and uh, they grow closer to Christ. Uh, we ask that you would um, continue to graciously provide financially for every family here and that we would all be wise stewards with what you entrust to us because we all know it all belongs to you. We pray for our missionaries, pray specifically for uh, Dave and Jen Cox, that they would be fruitful in Romania and Turkey. We pray for Reach Global, that you might open up opportunities for them to share their faith with the people that they help here in Fort Myers. And I pray for the volunteers this week that uh, it would be a life-changing experience as they see that serving you and putting you first in their life is the best life to live. So we ask that you would change lives and uh, help us to bring honor and glory to you. Help us to be forgiving people. And I pray for that you would protect us all from the evil one. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, like I say, I, I think I'm thankful for each and every one of you that you really do care for one another, and uh, thank you very much. It's, it means a lot to me. As I say, we're a family, right? Brothers and sisters in Christ, and um, we're called to love each other. Well, I was going to pick up back in uh, Second Timothy. I started that before Christmas, and then you always get hit the holidays. You get Thanksgiving, and you've got to do a Thanksgiving sermon, and then we celebrate Advent, so you have to do uh, hope and peace and joy and love. And then last week I did Simeon. Sometimes I'll look at the lectionary and see what, what I don't know. Baptists didn't follow a lectionary, but most of the mainline churches, uh, Episcopal and Catholic churches, follow a lecture, lectionary where they recommend certain passages at certain times of the year. And so every once in a while, I'll uh, look at the lectionary and see what they're recommending the pastors to preach on. So I'm going to pick up here. Um, as Before Thanksgiving, we were looking at this, and Paul's in prison. In Rome, I like it because uh, it's a book to pastors. Paul had sent Timothy to, Epaphr to Ephesus to pastor the Church of Jesus Christ in Ephesus. Uh, Timothy was probably between the ages of 30 and 40, and Paul was nearing the end of his life. And, um, and what he, he writes, Timothy, he says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So Paul commands Timothy to flee the evil desires of youth. Now, the, the Greek word translated flee means to run in order to escape capture. So, so the believer in Jesus Christ is commanded to continually and persistently to be on the run, as it were, from the evil desires of youth or the sins which so easily entangle young people. Now, we have to ask, what are the evil desires of youth? Paul is telling Timothy to flee or continually and persistently to run from. And almost everyone who reads this passage uh, immediately thinks Paul's telling Timothy to flee sexual immorality. And we are told numerous times in the scripture to flee sexual immorality. 
But every commentary I looked at said that there's no doubt that sexual uh, desire is strong in youth and believers in Jesus Christ are commanded to flee from sexual immorality. Um, so uh, no matter what your age. So we shouldn't eliminate sexual immorality from the evil desires of youth that Timothy is to avoid. Yet every commentary I looked at also said that uh, there are probably other evil desires of youth that Paul is telling Timothy to flee because of the context in which this letter is written. Um, as we said, Timothy was a pastor of the church at Ephesus. And um, like most pastors, Timothy had some people problems. What do they say? The ministry would be a really great job if you didn't have to deal with people, that's what they say. Some people say the church would be a really great place if we didn't have a pastor, you know. Uh, but there may have been both older men in the church who resented Timothy's leadership because Paul wrote Timothy in um, 1 Timothy, he says, don't let look, anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Um, now, there were definitely uh, professing believers in Jesus Christ in the church at Ephesus, which were teaching false doctrines and who were destroying the faith of other professing believers in Jesus Christ within the church because Paul wrote Timothy in first letter as well. He says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, Stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. So the unity of the church of Jesus Christ in Ephesus was fragile. And to be honest with you, the unity of the church of Jesus Christ is fragile in every town. And uh, in the next verse, Paul wrote Timothy and said this, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. That's why I don't get involved in the paint colors, nor the color of the carpet, nor should we buy a, a Steinway or a Baldwin piano. I'm not an expert on those. I let other people handle those. But uh, don't have anything to do with foolish or stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. So given the context of this verse, every commentator believes that since Timothy must set an example for the believers in Jesus Christ in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity, and he needs to confront and correct professing believers in Jesus Christ who are teaching and believing false doctrines. He needs to teach the truth and protect the unity of the church. There are evil desires of youth Timothy should flee from. So some of them say, some of the commentaries say, one of them is Timothy should flee from being proud and he should flee from being dogmatic. It's, you know, I, I'm, I'm the head of the church, you know, I'm the boss. I'm right, you're wrong. You know, many, many times young people think they know everything. And young people can be arrogant, dogmatic in their viewpoints. Uh, they decide what is right and refuse to listen to anyone else. You know, I always love it when, um, I was thinking about this this morning in the shower, I, when the people who aren't married know everything there is about marriage. Uh, I remember one guy in seminary, he was still single, but he knew everything there was about marriage. Or the people that don't have any children that know everything about child raising. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to experience it. Get, get the rough edges knocked off of you. And 
So they decide what is right. They refuse to listen to anyone. And Peter wrote to the elders of the church and said this. He said, all of you. And actually, I'm going to read it because what I'll do is I'll, I'll, to save time, I'll cut off verses. But I don't do it to prove my point. In context here, it, it says, he says to the younger, he says, um, young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. And as I said, you know, we're to honor our fathers and mothers, honor our grandparents. I, I believe that younger people in the congregation have a, should uh, honor uh, the older women as they honor their mother, honor the older men as they would their father, and um, treat other men and women with respect. And um, so he says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. My associate in Muskegon, he said he wanted to, he was a lay person. He was a, a principal of a grade school. He said his desire some, was someday to write a book called The Pride of the Pastor. I don't think he was writing about me, but he might have been. I'm not sure. But Timothy should flee from being proud. He should flee from being dogmatic. Secondly, uh, Timothy should flee from being impatient and intolerant. You know, many times young people want what they want and they want it now. They become impatient and inconsiderate with the people who don't agree with them. They think the people who don't agree with them are keeping them from getting what they want. And unfortunately in the church, making unilateral decisions and then becoming impatient and inconsiderate toward the people who oppose your idea can cause irreparable damage to the body of Christ. And so for me, I always said, when I come into a church, the only thing I really want to do is change your hearts. Because if our hearts are right, uh, we can live together in unity. But I've seen so many pastors go in and, and make big changes uh, the first year or two, and they don't last the third. Because my, my seminary professor used to say, um, the first year you can do no wrong, the second year you can do no right, and the third year you leave or they leave, one of the two. Depends on. So Timothy should flee from being impatient and intolerant. <coughs> There's so many decisions that don't really mean a whole lot in church. And so you have to decide, and I've, I've said that many times in my office, do I want to die on this hill? You know, is this hill worth dying for? And many times I say, no, in the long run, it doesn't really make any difference. But Paul wrote the believers in Thessalonica, and he said, we urge you, brothers and sisters, be patient with everyone. So if you'll be patient with me, I appreciate that. And I'll try to be patient with you and everyone. Thirdly, Timothy should flee from being selfish and demanding. That may be very similar. Um, Many times young people want to be the boss. They don't want to be in charge so they can get what they want. Uh, like one pastor said, the best thing for this church is if we could get a couple of deaths. Yeah. They want to be in charge so they can get what they want. Uh, they stand up for their rights. They claim their privileges and fight to get their share of the glory. And the results are envy jealousy, uh, and, and quarrels. Um, Paul, told Tim, Paul told the people in Philippi, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look, not only, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. There's always the stories about pastors that want to build a building, and, and so they 
get the church in debt and then they leave, right? Leave the church holding the, the debt. So flee from being selfish and demanding. Should flee from being quick to argue, debate and disagree. Young people are quick to argue, debate and disagree while doing nothing. Sounds like I'm describing my children. No, actually, my, my children would say, I'm looking at you, Ashley. You, you, you probably say, I'm the one that's quick to argue and uh, debate but, uh, and disagree. And nothing's over. My dad was that way, you know. We'd get together for family reunions, and he would get us going on politics or religion or something, and then we'd start arguing, and he would go to bed. And the fight would go on for a lot longer. But what we read earlier is the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. And, and the last one really is, um, well, two more. Timothy should flee from falling in love with what's new, what's original, what's unique. Uh, young people have a tendency to criticize something because it's old. They want something new. They want something original. They want something unique simply because it is new, it's original and unique. And they underrate the value of experience. And to a certain extent, we could call it generational snobbery. I remember being in a, a Christian bookstore and one of the young ladies in there said, at our church, we don't sing any songs that were written longer than two years ago. I thought to myself, what a shame. You're missing the wisdom through the generations. But so Timothy should flee from craving wealth, material possessions, and the glory that goes with them. Now, money is good. We appreciate your generosity to the church. Pray that we'll be wise with the Lord's money. Bring, use it, bring honor and glory to him. But the love of money. Uh, Paul says it's the root of all kinds of evil. It's, it's not the money that's the root of all kinds of evil. It's the love of it. Lo if you love money, you'll, you'll kill people. You'll steal from them. You'll, you'll do all kinds of crimes to get the money. Uh, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and um, pierced themselves with many griefs. So Losing the battle to these youthful desires could not help Timothy or any pastor or church leader resolve a leadership, a doctrinal, or sin problem within the church. They would simply add to the conflict. And for his own sake, the sake of the church of Jesus Christ, um, Timothy was to flee the temptations to be proud and dogmatic, impatient and intolerant, selfish and demanding. Uh, the quick to argue, debate, and disagree, falling in love with the new, original, and unique, and craving wealth and material possessions. Um, you know, every pastor, every church leader, or believer in Jesus Christ, for, um, for their own sake and the sake of the church of Jesus Christ, should carefully run from tem such temptations and inclinations. And on the other hand, every pastor, church leader, or believer in Jesus Christ should carefully pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And so once again, Paul is commanding Timothy to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And the word Pursue means going after, go after it or go for it. Timothy is to pursue righteousness. Uh, Paul is commanding Timothy to pursue mm. complete obedience, God's word. Paul is commanding Timothy to choose to obey God's word rather than his own sinful passions. And, and this means that Paul is commanding Timothy to put off what belonged to his old life and to put on what belongs to his new life in Christ, to put to death his earthly members, and to set his mind on heavenly things. 
to crucify his flesh and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as Timothy pursues righteousness, he will put to death hatred. He'll put to death jealousy. He'll put to death fits of rage. He'll put to death selfish ambition, envy, bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, lying, deceit. He'll put to death filthy language and sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. He'll put to death every form of malice. And as Timothy pursues righteousness, he will seek to be filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit, seek to be loving and kind and good, faithful, compassionate, humble, gentle, patient, forgiving, considerate, submissive, impartial, peace-loving, and full of mercy toward other people. And as Timothy pursues righteousness, he will plead for God's forgiveness and for God's power to overcome the sin that so easily entangles him. Um, and that's why I say, um, that's our goal. Many times we pursue other things, but our job is to pursue righteousness to become like Christ, Jesus Christ. Uh, believers in Jesus Christ are commanded to be holy because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and our Heavenly Father are holy. Paul commanded the believers in Jesus Christ to be holy when he wrote, Peter says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And my pastor in Southern California, he used to say, first of all, we're the people of God. And then we do the work of God. But many of us, we want to do the work of God before we're the people of God. Paul wrote Timothy earlier. And he said, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us. He has saved us and called us to what? A holy life. Um, and uh, when we fail in our pursuit to be holy and sin less, or when we fail in our pursuit to be holy and we do fall in sin, the Apostle John says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purif purify us from all unrighteousness. So I, I want to read this, the rest of that. He says, he says, If we say, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So John says, I rank this to you so that you will not sin. I don't want you to sin, but if you do sin, we have one who's <coughs> the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, uh, we need to admit we're a sinner, and we want to... Uh, Secondly... We're to pursue faith, pursue faith. Now, Paul is commanding Timothy to pursue a confidence in what we hope for and an assurance about what we do not see. Uh, and as I thought of this, I said, Paul is commanding Timothy to pursue a confidence and assurance that there is a God and that God is the only living and true God, the, the God revealed in the Bible. He's the creator of heaven and earth, the sovereign ruler of the universe, and the judge of all mankind. That's why I asked in the catechism today, who made you? God did. We're not here by chance. God made us. And he's commanding Timothy to pursue a confidence and assurance that the Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal God who came to earth from heaven, became a man, a true human being, that Jesus Christ truly lived a sinless life and truly died on the cross for our sins and was raised bodily from the dead on the third day. 
that Jesus Christ truly spent 40 days on earth, giving many convincing proofs to his disciples that he was physically alive and ascended back into heaven. Because everything in our culture says there is no God. Jesus Christ was a just good moral teacher, a human being, that he really didn't rise from the dead. And so Paul is commanding Timothy to pursue a confidence and assurance that God's word is true, that those sinful people who trust in and those sinful people who believe in and receive Jesus Christ as the only Savior given by God to save sinful people, they are forgiven of their sins, all their sins for Christ's sake, and they're saved eternally from God's wrath through him. Uh, Paul's commanding Timothy to pursue a confidence and assurance that to die on earth as a believer in Jesus Christ and to live is to live in heaven with Christ and is better by far anything this life has to offer. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To pursue a confidence and assurance that and assurance that God will wipe every tear from our eyes, give us a reunion with our loved ones who have died in Christ, and give us a new powerful eternal body that will never experience death or pain again. And Paul is commanding Timothy to pursue a confidence and assurance that God is faithful and able to do what he promised. So he's telling Timothy to pursue a confidence and assurance that God is faithful and his labor in the Lord is not in vain. God will reward him for his faith, obedience, and love when he gets to heaven. The author of Hebrews wrote, wrote this. He says, without faith, it is impossible to please him, please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Uh, God's not just interested in saving faith. Uh, he's interested in the growth of our faith, and because he wants us to grow our faith to grow, he puts us in circumstances that stretch and mature our faith. James wrote, consider it per joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Uh, God tests us on the level of life, the trials of many kinds. He tests us to see if we'll trust him as we experience problems in real life or if we'll chuck our faith and say, well, God must not be there because if, if God was there, he wouldn't allow me to experience this difficulty in my life. You know, we need to pursue or go after a confident and assured faith in God so that we can trust the Lord like Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Caleb, Joshua, Daniel, Gideon, Shadrach, Meshach, and away we go. And Job, oh, you're still listening. You're still listening. Okay. Uh, you know, you think about this. By faith, Noah, when, he, when, he, when warned about things, not yet seen, he had never seen rain before. He had never seen a flood before. But by faith, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. I'm sure people laughed at him, but he believed God, even though he had never seen it. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father. Why? Because he considered God faithful who had made the promise. All the circumstances looked like it's not going to happen, but he, he had faith in God who had made the promise. And I like Moses. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Moses dis regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt simply because he was looking ahead to heaven. He was looking ahead to his reward. He believed 
And God, even, I guess God had appeared to him in the burning bush. Well, we can strengthen our faith by reading and hearing the word of God. Uh, believers in Jesus Christ who never read the word of God, never listen to it as it's preached, will never grow in their faith in God. God still answers prayer. And we need to have, believe that. Uh, Jesus says, what is impossible for men is possible for God. Thirdly, and I'll hustle here. Uh, Timothy is to pursue love. And I, sometimes I think I preach this too much, but Paul tells Timothy, pursue love. Paul is commanding Timothy to pursue or go after keeping the greatest and the second greatest commandment. Because Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus said the second greatest commandment is love your neighbors as your church. You would think that some pastors think the greatest commandment is give to the church, right? Give your money. But no, it's love your neighbor. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus told his disciples, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The last night he was with them, he says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And uh, I, by this, all men shall know. I, didn't, I cut that one off. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And the apostle John, we've read this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but ha have not love, what? I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. And then he says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And now we, these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we must deliberately choose to love other believers in Christ and choose, deliberately choose to love unbelievers. And we're often exposed to the choice of how we're going to react towards someone who has irritated us, <clears throat> has done something to upset us or make us angry. Our flesh tells us, tell them off, uh, get even, hit back. But if we want to be used by God, we cannot give in to our flesh and, and follow through on our sinful desires. Instead, we must deliberately give a soft answer that will turn away wrath or apologize for having given offense. Or even though our stance was right, we said it in a way that was wrong. I, I've had that. <clears throat> I remember <clears throat> one time when I was young, I made a foolish mistake like Timothy. Um, I told my, uh, we had a Christian ed committee and they decided to change the curriculum, um, Sunday school curriculum. And I had a, a gentleman that had taught Sunday school for 10, 15 years and he drove the church bus. And he said, I've used scripture press all 15 years I taught. I, I like it, I know it, it doesn't take me long to prepare, but he was the best Sunday school teacher we had. And the lady said, if you don't like the new curriculum, you can quit. And he said, okay, and he quit. And I met with the ladies and I said, you know, you guys are, you guys think you're the Pope. I mean, this guy's the best Sunday school teacher we have. The kids love him. The parents love him. 
he enjoys teaching Sunday school and, and, and you're saying you got to do it my way or it's my way or the highway. You're not teaching the class. He is. Give him some input into the curriculum. Well, they got mad. And the next morning, about eight o'clock, one of their husbands knocked on my door. He said, uh, you got problems. I said, <laughs> I said, yeah, I woke up about 3.30 wondering where I could find another job. And uh, what they did, uh, the men met with me to pacify the women. And they said, Ron, what you said is correct. But the attitude that you had was wrong. And so you need to apologize to women. Even though you're right, they are running it like they're the boss, the Pope. You, you need to apologize to them. So I did, and one of them, I, one of them was a school teacher, and uh, she was actually unmarried. And I didn't talk to her till four o'clock because you know that she's in school. And I went and apologized to her, and, and she said, What took you so long? Yeah, that's what I said. I, that's what I said. You know, you know, it, it works both ways. I know pastors make mistakes. I know, I, I, I know it. I, I, I've, I've made them myself. But the last point is really, uh, and better get going. Now about your love for one another, Paul wrote to the believers in Thessalonica. Love for one another. We do not need to uh, write to you. For you yourselves know you, you have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And the last one, and we'll do it real quickly. Timothy is to pursue peace. Pursue peace. Paul is commanding Timothy to pursue peace with God, peace with his fellow Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and peace with all men. Paul told the Romans this. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace. Live at peace with everyone. And one of the marks of a mature, spirit-filled believer in Jesus Christ is a winsome and friendly spirit that delights in peace and harmony rather than arguments and division. Paul told the Romans, uh, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and uh, to mutual edification. Uh, the author of Hebrews wrote, make every effort to live in peace with all men. I mean, it's just natural. Satan wants to divide us. Satan wants us to hate us, hate each other and uh, to be at enmity with each other. But God wants us to be at peace. Make every effort to live in peace with all men. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. James wrote, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. First, the, the first most important thing is holiness. I mean, if you think about it, was there anything wrong with either of those curriculums? No, I would say both of them were used. Although the one, you know, they were teaching on Moses and it said Moses' sister went to, uh, went to her dad and the father said, let's pray about it. See, someone will pick Moses up, and that's not in the scripture. So, you know, I have a problem with Sunday school curriculum having a, a, a point they want to make. Of course, they want the children to go to pray about things, but that's not why. Use a different text. Don't change the story biblically to make a point that you want to make. So there was a little question on the curriculum, but... Uh, both of them probably could have been used, but the process that uh, the change was made is more, is, was as important as the curriculum. And then he says, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. 
As believers in Jesus Christ, we must make every effort to be peacemakers. As we've said in the past, in some cases, it's not possible to live in peace with all men because they refuse to be, live in peace with us. But Paul said, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Timothy is to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. A believer in Jesus Christ is never to live detached or aloof from fellow believers in Jesus Christ. A believer in Jesus Christ is to be committed to the Christian fellowship. And the author of Hebrews wrote this. He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as we, as some are in the habit of doing, and even so, more so now with church attendance being the lowest point in American history. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we want to be used by God to build up and encourage other believers in Jesus Christ, we must flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Let's pray. Father, help us to flee um, the desires of youth. Help us to flee sexual immorality. Help us to flee pride, arrogance, selfishness arrogance and i pray that you'd help us to pursue christ likeness help us to seek to live obedient life before you help us to seek faith where we trust in your promises more than we trust in our five senses help us to pursue love loving christ obeying his commands and loving one another as he has loved us and help us to pursue peace with our fellow believers in Christ and all men. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would uh, please let's stand. We're going to sing our last song and you know it's a uh, it's amazing grace that we're going to sing and it's that grace is something we need all the time right in order to to do the things that the pastor was talking about, that Paul was, you know, um, exhorting Timothy to, we need that grace um, all the time. Okay. That's it.
Just because I want to seek peace, I'm sorry I went a little long today, so let's close. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. To uh, welcome Rod and Michelle into the church. Tell them we're glad to have them.